Welcome to the rollout of the Department of Defense's 20th anniversary China Military Power Report, often called the uh, CMPR because folks in the Pentagon often love to have their acronyms. Uh, I'm Zach Cooper from the American Enterprise Institute. I'm joined today uh, from the Pentagon with uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, Chad Sabraja. So happy to have you here. A uh, few ground rules before we begin. After a brief introduction, Deputy Assistant Secretary Sabraja will walk us through some of the highlights of this year's report and then we'll begin a discussion. We also have an incredible number of China experts on this, uh, on this Zoom call and a lot of other national, ex national security expertise in the audience. And so we'll be looking forward to taking your questions at the end. You can enter questions into the Q&A function via Zoom, or you can tweet them using the hashtag China Military Power 2020. Now onto our guest uh, for today. Chad Sabraja serves as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for China in the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Indo-Pacific Security Affairs. In this role, he is responsible for advising senior leadership within the Defense Department on all matters pertaining to the development and implementation of defense strategies, plans, policies, and bilateral security relations for China. Previously, Dasdi Sabraja served as the Director of the China Research Group for the U.S. Marine Corps. He's also served as the Deputy Director of the China Strategic Focus Group at the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command and Country Director for China, Taiwan, and Mongolia under the J-5 Strategic Planning and Policy Directorate. And from 1985 to 2012, he served in the U.S. Marine Corps, where he led Marines up through the battalion level and deployed across the Middle East, Africa, and the Indo-Pacific. Uh, he's also been a Marine attache at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. So as you can see, uh, Dazi Sabraja has done just about everything possible in the defense-focused world on China. We're so glad to have him here today uh, to talk us through this really important report. It's the 20th anniversary. And I know you've got a, a lot to walk us through. So Dazi Sabraja, over to you to make some opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Zach. Good morning. Um, uh, very appreciative. Certainly, uh, thanks to you personally, and, and thanks to AEI for hosting the event. It's important, certainly as an aspect of uh, the Secretary's uh, desires to be transparent and, and, and fully share the information in the report. As you mentioned, the, the Department of Defense has provided the China Military Power Report for uh, about two decades now, um, and it's long served as a touchstone for authoritative information uh, for Congress and the report's other audiences as well. This year's report is almost 200 pages long. Uh, I won't certainly try to summarize it all, and I certainly would ask those online today to not necessarily quiz me. I have not memorized the entire report yet, uh, but I strongly encourage the audience to read it. Um, instead, I will briefly discuss why, why this year's report uh, is particularly important, and I'll offer a view uh, of what the major changes are were made and, and why. Um, as the Department of Defense continues to address the strategic challenges posed by the People's Republic of China and continues to implement the national defense strategy in which China is a principal focus, Secretary Esper has made it clear that we as a department must deepen our understanding of China and the People's Liberation Army. And the China Military Power Report is one of many ways in which we can support that goal. Uh, given the growing focus on China, it's important that this year's report provide an authoritative and sober explanation of China's national strategy as it relates to security issues involving China and developments within China's armed forces. To do so, the report explains the relationship between the Communist Party of China's strategy, its ideology, political and governing systems, and the party's view of China's external environment particularly systemic rivalry and the international strategic competition that's underway. These factors are drivers of China's foreign policy, military civil fusion strategy, defense policy, and military strategy. These relationships are essential for understanding the current and future course of the PLA, including its evolving roles and missions in support of China's strategy and its long-term goal to become, uh, quote, a world-class military by 2049. For the, report, uh, for the report to provide the most accurate assessment of China's strategy possible, we felt it was important to use very authoritative sourcing. Over my career, um, I've always found that there's no better starting point for understanding China's strategy than China itself. This report uh, carefully and deliberately use, uh, uses authoritative 
Communist Party documents, writings, speeches to provide a more complete and accurate picture and account of China's strategy, its ambitions and political and governing systems as articulated and understood by the party itself. This requires obviously careful work and, and attention. On one hand, we don't want to necessarily amplify the party's false narratives, propaganda, or, or hollow rhetoric. On the other hand, we in the United States at large can sometimes fall into the trap of dismissing too much of what China says as indecipherable uh, political rhetoric. And if you ignore what China says about itself, it can place us at a greater risk of relying on the caricatures of China's strategy and misunderstanding its strategic intent. So by assessing China through this lens, the China Military Power Report is able to provide some, I think, better insights. Uh, for instance, it's clear that in recent years, the party has become increasingly confident in the superiority of its political and governance systems and its ability to manage China's challenges towards its strategic ends. This confidence, for example, is manifest in what is often described as China's increasingly assertive international behavior. Moreover, it's clear that the party's leaders, rather than risk adverse, uh, uh, rather than being risk averse or uh, reactionary, view themselves as modernizers of a certain stripe who are confident that they've struck upon a formula that works and works better. China's economic and social transformation under the party over the past 40 years in particular have generated greater confidence, not timidity. As this report describes, China's strategy seeks to achieve, quote, the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, unquote, by 2049, China's main national end state. This strategy led by the party entails a determined pursuit of political and social modernity and includes efforts to expand China's national power, perfect its governance system, revive, and revise the international order. The Communist Party leadership characterizes their strategy to achieve moder modernity as a national endeavor that will transform China and certainly in turn the world. It's important to acknowledge that the Communist Party does not pursue these strategic ends mechanically or have necessarily a detailed plan that stretches out decades. Rather, what the party does is it sets long-term national objectives that the party drives the, the party state and the Chinese society towards um, and certainly adapts to challenges and failures and successes along the way. While party leaders have consistently pursued national rejuvenation as its goal, they have demonstrated a degree of adaptability and execution to seize opportunities and manage threats to their strategy and interests. Moreover, China's strategy is not without deficiencies. China's strategy entails uh, numerous contradictions between China's desires to continue benefiting from the current peace and prosperity of the current international system in order to advance China's development towards its national rejuvenation. At the same time, China's strategic ambitions and political governing systems, coupled with growing means and opportunity, induce it to adopt a more assertive and revisionist policies, which, of course, threaten the peace and security it desires in many ways. Contextualizing China's defense ambitions is another key part of this report. The report does not claim that China's military is currently 10 feet tall, uh, nor I think certainly does China either. The PLA faces a number of challenges and Beijing is working to overcome those, which is really an important point. At the center is that the party wants the, the PLA, I think, ultimately to be 10 feet tall. Ambitions matter here. And over the past 20 years, what we've seen is that China's ambitions drive the PLA's sweeping modernization and reform efforts, which this year's CMPR has cataloged uh, clearly as have previous editions and which for the national defense strategy identifies, uh, a, a it serves as a critical source um, from which uh, we may we face eroding competitive military advantage. The Communist Party's stated goals are to transform the PLA into a world-class military by mid-century. While China has not defined exactly what uh, world-class military means, it is likely that China will seek to build a military that is equal to, or in some cases superior to, the US military or the military of any other great power that China perceives as a potential threat. Given the context of the Communist Party's strategy of national rejuvenation, it is unlikely that the party will seek, to end, uh, seek an end state in which China remains in a position of military inferiority vis-a-vis -vis the United States or any other rival. 
A permanent condition of military inferiority is anathema to the party's goal of transformation uh, to transform China into a, quote, great modern socialist country, unquote. The party views China's growing strength as useful only to the extent that the party state can mobilize it. The party is modernizing and reforming the PLA to support its strategy. While the advancing military capabilities are important, we want to emphasize, and I think it's clear in the report, that the PLA is not intended to be merely a showpiece of Chinese modernity. The CPC has, the Communist Party has spent the last several years completely tearing out and rewiring the PLA organizationally with the goal to transform into a more joint force that is increasingly combat ready, innovative, and global. Finally, the report highlights that China's investments in and reforms of the PLA are intended to transform it into a more practical instrument of statecraft. And that is certainly called out within the report. The, the party has called for the PLA to take an active role in advancing the PRC's foreign policy, particularly with respect to China's global interests and its aims to revise aspects of the international order. Beijing very much intends or believes it will have to use this, uh, use this uh, military instrument to advance and defend its conception of Chinese sovereignty, security, and developmental interests. Zach, I, I just want to again reiterate my appreciation for the four today, uh, your efforts, and certainly as well as the participation of the audience online, and I look forward to the questions. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for walking us through the report. You're right. It's, it's a long 200 pages, but there's so much content in there. And so uh, as folks are probably reading through it at home, I wanted to take a little bit of time to jump through at least some of the things that jumped out to me in the report. Um, and, and the first is uh, on the comment that you ended on about Chinese power projection and, and overseas objectives. So this year's report discusses China's continued turn towards power projection, and it states that China's military is not only intended to be merely a showpiece of China's modernity or to keep it focused solely on regional threats. Um, and you know, so this it's very clear that this is a, a global military or military that would like to have global ambitions. And one thing that jumped out at me was that this report, unlike others, says that the PRC has likely considered locations for PLA military logistics facilities in Myanmar, Thailand, Singapore, Indonesia, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, United Arab Emirates, Kenya, Seychelles, Tanzania, Angola, and Tajikistan. And the report also mentions the existing base in Djibouti and, of course, uh, some debate within Cambodia about China gaining access to a naval base. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit both about the logic of China's turn towards power projection and whether you think there's been an acceleration maybe over the last year that this report focused on in China's uh, looking outward beyond its near seas towards uh, more overseas objectives? Yeah, Zach, that's a great question. Thank you for that. I, um, I, will, I will reinforce your conclusion here, uh, which is obviously also found in the report, which is that the Chinese do have, uh, the Chinese leadership, the, the Communist Party has an aspiration for great power status by virtually every measure of comprehensive or composite national power that you, that you can measure. Uh, that no, not least of which is the People's Liberation Army, and to achieve that, that means that they have to uh, have you know have global convergence at at the broadest scale possible. Uh, for the PLA, that means that they do have the intent to go out. I think that's certainly one of the aspects uh, of what world class military means, which is the capacity to have influence at distance, at a time and place of their choosing, and they certainly uh, aspire to do that. Within the last year, there certainly has been an uptick in their aspirations uh, as they declare or talk about them. I, I don't think this is necessarily a new objective that they have. It's certainly part and, and intimately linked to their long-term national strategic aspirations. But things are changing and they're changing rapidly in China and we see those developments uh, unfolding right in front of our eyes. And if you don't pay attention, if you're not attentive to them, is, is that you could miss those. Those basing facilities, as you notice, are important. Uh, they're testing. Uh, they're trying to explore, they're trying to understand, they're trying to devise and, and come up with plans about what, where and, and what types of bases and how they might use those facilities overseas best. Uh, I don't think that they've reached necessarily final conclusions on any of those yet. Certainly with Djibouti they have. Um, 
but their aspirations are not small and they're not limited to a single geographic location. This is global in scale. So we'll continue to monitor that. Those, there's aspects of this that uh, may be helpful in the future, but, but truly our eyes are on, on how that impacts the United States, national security, our interests overall, and that of our allies and partners. Wonderful. And um, another issue that is going to get a lot of attention, I think, is the um, report statements about uh, missile capabilities in particular. Uh, in 2000, the first China military power report assessed that the PLA lacked the capabilities, organization, and readiness for modern warfare. And this year's report says China has marshaled the resources, technology, and political will over the past two decades to strengthen and modernize the PLA in nearly every respect. Uh, indeed, as this report shows, China is already ahead of the United States in certain areas. And the report calls out three. I wanted to just talk about one of them for a minute, which is the conventionally armed missile capability. Uh, and, and some of these are also nuclear capable as well. This year's report shows a pretty large increase in the estimated number of intermediate, intermediate range ballistic missiles in China's arsenal. I assume some of those are DF-26s, but I, I don't know. Um, so I wanted to ask you, you know, that the increase in this report is up from something like 80 launchers last year to 200 estimated this year. Uh, so that's a pretty big increase, especially when the rest of the ballistic missile force has stayed relatively uh, stable, at least as, as estimated by the Defense Department. Um, and we've obviously just seen this capability tested last week in the South China Sea. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about China's missile forces and how they're changing and what do you think is behind some of these changes? Well, certainly I, there, there's not a single causal factor for that. Um, it, I think this touches on, uh, on many, many aspects of how the Chinese perceive themselves and where they need to be, both as they've met or are trying to meet 2020 markers, 2035 markers, and then ultimately uh, mid-century markers for the development of the nation writ large and, and the Chinese military in particular. So uh, the missiles are, are certainly um, a consequential aspect of what they're undertaking. And we it has our full attention as, as you can imagine. Uh, not least of which is, is the, re ration, the reasons and the rationale behind why we have in the past, uh, you know, uh, accepted and, and promoted limitations on those kind of systems for their inherently escalatory uh, nature of, of what they provide, but not having that uh, uh, or having been constrained by that in the past, the Chinese just simply haven't been part of those international agreements or accords and have not felt the, the necessity to do so and pursued a much more escalatory path. For them, uh, it's about technological technological prestige, fielding advanced capabilities and, and, uh, and forces, uh, certainly not least of which is what they perceive to be an asymmetric advantage that they will have over the United States, particularly during a time when we had self-imposed or agreed to limitations that we adhered to and they have not. So in this case, it's a, it's a change of condition for them where they felt some advantage, uh, a strength, an area of, of potential strength that they might have and a potential area of weakness that they assess that we might possess. So it, it is important that the change in the numbers that you see, of course, in any report are only a snapshot in China, time. Uh, they're dynamic and they change. They have certainly changed since the previous report and they undoubtedly will change as you see next year's report, which, which we, of course, next week we'll begin uh, developing. So um, uh, with that is the PLA has fielded approximately 200 inter, uh, uh, IRBM launchers and more than 200 missiles. And we continue to monitor, um, uh, monitor that very closely and look for other ways that, uh, to extend the United States advantage and that of our allies and partners. Um, I, we do expect to, to, to see more on the horizon, but the, certainly the Chinese are aware of the changes of conditions that have happened over the last really about a year and a half in terms of uh, constraints and limitations on those, and, and that may be a point of uh, departure for discussions with them. That's fantastic. And, you know, one of the areas that I think is connected, obviously, to the IRBM force uh, is nuclear weapons. And here, actually, one thing I really appreciate about the report is it's, you know, we're not just trying to present, I think, as much negative information about what the Chinese military is doing. It's really very fact-based. And there's some facts here that are, I think, going to surprise some people. Uh, so uh, the, the report states that China's nuclear warhead stockpile is in the low 200s. 
Um, this is not a number that typically has been quoted in the China Military Power Report. And as you know, many of the outside reports had suggested maybe that number was closer to the low 300s or even, or even higher, and in some cases, you know, much higher. Um, and so I wanted to ask a little bit about, uh, about nuclear weapons. There are a couple of other interesting things in the report on nuclear weapons, one of which is that it suggests China is building a silo-based uh, nuclear capability for launch on warning which I think is going to come as a surprise to some people, at least in the community. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the Chinese nuclear force and how it's changing? And Obviously, we've seen the last few weeks, Secretary Esper uh, and others, the Undersecretary Anderson, for example, uh, mentioned that China hopes to double or may be thinking about doubling this nuclear force over the next decade. So we look forward to your insights about where the Chinese nuclear capabilities are headed. Yeah, that's great. Uh, they should be attentive. Certainly we are. And, and that's, I think, uh, the rationale for why we ensured that we included the, the best numbers and best understanding that we could have in this report. It really stems from two issues. One is uh, going back to some of the opening comments, which is as an aspect of China's long-term national strategic aspirations and, and what those mean for uh, China's strategic systems uh, to include the PLA and what, they, what, the, what, what those capacities are is you will see the trend lines that are in play right now. So uh, the report does uh, contend that there's currently an estimated low 200s in terms of uh, warhead stockpiles, and it's projected to at least double in size over the next decade as China expands and modernizes its nuclear forces. I, I think it's also important that the report notes that China is expanding and modernizing and diversifies, diversifying its nuclear forces across the board. It's, so. Just looking at number of warheads by itself is not the entire picture uh, or doesn't paint a holistic understanding of where the, where the Chinese uh, are or maybe where they want to go. As the report notes, within the next decade, China is on course to expand its uh, uh, ballistic submarine fleet and field more capable and longer range sea launch ballistic missiles, complete development of its nuclear capable air launch ballistic missiles and field them along with associated bombers. Uh, field additional road mobile ICBMs and potentially expand its silo-based ICBM force. So uh, as has been noted by others, <clears throat> and, and as the report contends, is that there's an aspect of that they're obviously in pursuit of it, the full suite and capacities and to include the, the building out of infrastructure for a more modernized, capable and, and larger uh, capacity in this area. Wonderful. And I, I want to turn a little bit now to some regional issues and maybe start with a bit of framing um, about the PLA's global role. The report states that China's military strategy remains based on the co concept of active defense. And as you know well, uh, Taylor Favell has written a book on this recently, came out last year. Um, and he suggests that in the short term, the central focus of China's military strategy and strategic planning will revolve around three areas, Taiwan, the Sino-Indian border, and the South China Sea. Uh, there's obviously a lot happening on all three, um, and I want to delve into them a little bit. But before I do, I want to ask a little bit about the emphasis in this year's report on China's desire to um, act globally, which is really a main focus, at least in the first a couple dozen pages, you know, there's a lot of added text that walks through uh, where China came from, especially back going to 2000 and where, where it's headed. So can you talk a little bit about how, uh, how the Defense Department thinks about China's regional role versus global role and the degree to which the PLA is sort of uh, prioritizing one over the other? Yeah, I can. I, it, I think that that's uh, really kind of a central point of a lot of our thinking here um, within the department, certainly within our office, is is again going back to where China's long-term national aspirations are as really the best tool by which you can illuminate where you see their military developing. <clears throat> so in the near term, certainly those things that are hot that are directly on their periphery, and particularly those things that involve their their national interests of sovereignty, security, and, and developmental aspirations. Uh, and those geographic locations that are right along their periphery will have been, will, and, and will certainly continue to remain uh, priority efforts for them. But really where China's eyes are on is, is understanding about how they're going to contend and, and, and potentially react through course of use of force for those 
but their eyes long-term on a global capacity. When I was served as a attache in Beijing just uh, just over 10 years ago, um, just the thought about the Chinese in terms of any kind of power projection globally was almost unthinkable. They had just begun, um, certainly had been undertaking peacekeeping operations under UN auspices for a long period of time, but just taking their first forays, you would note that when they would even do a very small sortie of ships on some kind of world tour, that was a, it was a significant undertaking for them now. Now that's a routine practice. So these things are changing in a very dynamic way. Long-term, it's for those bigger aspirations. And so those, those close-in issues that we study on a daily basis will become one of many, I think, in the future. That will necessitate, as you raise China's military strategy. Uh, the Chinese, it, it's not clear that they have uh, updated their strategy. They have certainly, Xi Jinping has provided very clear direction, uh, both in 2018 and 2019, to revise their military strategy. The PLA themselves have told me that their military strategy will re remain predicated on active defense, even though that very term itself has modified uh, across, or across the course of, uh, of the PLA's history. Um, it, it does appear that we're either on the cusp of or uh, it's already occurred that the Chinese will have a new military strategy. What we anticipate is that uh, this, mil this next military strategy from the Chinese or, or the ones in the near term will start to reflect uh, the requirements, uh, command and control frameworks of a much more uh, a broader regional approach or even a global approach. But that's where we know that they want to go over the long term. And so we'll be looking for those. And coming back now to uh, to the region and uh, especially to you know some of the more contested areas, I want to ask first about Taiwan. Um, you know, so much news just the last few weeks on Taiwan. Of course, yesterday, uh, Assistant Secretary of State David Stowell declassified a set of documents about the six assurances that were provided to Taiwan all the way back in, in 1982, and that was obviously an effort to um, decrease a little bit of the ambiguity surrounding uh, U.S. previous statements on Taiwan and to Taiwan. Um, one thing that's notable in this report is that there's a big change in the cross-strait uh, balance in ground forces. Air and naval forces, we see a little bit of a change, but on the ground side, uh, last year in the 2019 report, there was a roughly three to one advantage uh, in China's uh, edge uh, of active ground forces in the theater. And now that ratio is closer to five to one in theater between China and Taiwan. And if you look outside the theater, the ratio goes all the way up to 12 to one. Um, and I think this is going to be something that's going to obviously concern a lot of folks, not just in the United States, but in Taipei and elsewhere. Can you explain to us a little bit about what these changing dynamics mean for you know, potential time horizons for uh, China trying to actually launch a potential, say, invasion of Taiwan? Do Chinese leaders think that uh, the time horizon is, uh, that the window is opening or closing uh, for a potential invasion? And, and I know, you know, obviously we're seeing a lot of reforms in Taiwan itself, and the report goes into those as well. Uh, and, and the numbers I mentioned earlier are really only talking about active forces because obviously the Taiwan military has uh, shifted uh, its structure itself. And that's part of the reason that we're seeing this change in the, in the ratio of ground forces. But can you give us a sort of general sense of how you think Chinese leaders see uh, the cross-strait military balance and, and where that balance is heading? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question, Zach. Um, we might have to do about another five hours of uh, what big <laughs> you know, reactions to, to discuss that fully, but but you know the starting point and really the starting point of the report itself it is a very clear, uh, very clearly draws from authoritative commentary in this case the 19th Party Congress report, uh, where they explain as they have in the past that the unification of Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Macau is a, a central component of China's long-term national aspirations. So they've already laid that marker down as that's the expectation. Um, in terms of U.S. policy, U.S. policy has not changed. Uh, I think Secretary Stilwell mentioned that yesterday as well. Is, is and we've certainly communicated that to the Chinese. Is our, is our policy um, uh, remains consistent, and uh, but we certainly have a, a requirement to to continue to communicate that effectively to the Chinese and others uh, about what that policy is. In terms of the cross-strait balance, that certainly drives us. We know that in the opening aspect, uh, in the opening 
uh, chapters of the national defense strategy. We talk about that as a motivating aspect of where our current national strategy is, our national defense strategy is at, which is the ultimate erosion of military capacities, uh, defense capacities by the United States and the desires to close them. And I can tell you is that the secretary and everybody in the department is uh, intensely focused on doing so. Uh, those lines of effort are clear. Uh, we're acting on them. Um, and uh, there's certainly very powerful and strong indications of how those are, are those are working, and I think effectively, and certain not not least of which is from the Chinese themselves, who who see that they see the systemic transformation that the, the department's undertaking. The cross street ba balance is certainly uh, a, a crucial element of that. Um, you raise the numbers in particular. Certainly, our caution is that numbers are one aspect of that, but this is part of uh, holistic modernity. The Chinese themselves have reduced forces. Uh, uh, under their current reform efforts, but not as a, uh, a symbol of lessening capability or, or, or capacities, but in fact, uh, making better investments long term about uh, sharpening what those forces are, what who they're composed of, what their mission sets are. So I, I would only caution that the numbers have changed. They, they are in the report. Um, from the Taiwan's perspective, it's certainly better to ask the Taiwan authorities about what their view of that is. From our perspective, is is to ensure that that uh, that we stand ready in in any condition, uh, based on the president's direction, and I, and I think that's certainly where we're headed. Um, the aim here, I think, from all sides, to include the Chinese, is is that the worst case scenario is conflict, and uh, that's not where anybody wants to go. I think uh, certainly that's our view. I think that that's what the Chinese view is, and and uh, the best way to do that is ensure that we're always pr prepared and ready. Absolutely, and. Uh it's uh, 1.30, so I want to start bringing in some audience questions. We've got one on this specific topic from Bonnie Glazer over at the Center for Strategic International Studies. She asks, what is your assessment of the PLA's current capability to seize and control Taiwan? Do they have sufficient amphibious landing capability? And um, can you talk at all about what deficiencies exist uh, that the PLA has yet to master for that type of contingency. I know some of this obviously is going to be difficult for you to talk about in a public setting, but whatever you could say, I think we'd appreciate. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Certainly it's, uh, you know, the Defense Department gets paid to assess risk on a daily basis. Um, and so uh, we, we try to do that. And uh, I think pretty successfully. It's, uh, it's not a simple question. It's not a, an uncomplicated question. Um, but what I can say in, in, you know, going back to some of the opening comments is it's always base, best to start by taking stock of what the Chinese think. The Chinese had 2020 is, is critical, not only in terms of how many reports we've put out from the Defense Department, but 2020 served as a critical marker for the Chinese, uh, the PLA themselves, as directed by the party leadership. And that was a, a period which they have started moving away from a requirement or a capacity limited to blockading to now including the capacity to do uh, uh, full-scale amphibious assaults on Taiwan. Based on what they mentioned, in fact, in their own 2019 defense white paper is that they still have not made the full transition into being able to, to reach that capacity. But in any case, uh, that's what they're in pursuit of and they'll work very hard on it. Uh, it's always difficult to, to lay out all the different variables and how that might impact in any kind of scenario. I don't know, and, and I'm and I, uh, certainly not comfortable speculating on, on what those might look like. What I do know is that the Chinese have an a aspiration to have the complete suite of co coercion and compellence tools at hand uh, to change the condition as they see fit. Um, that's where we come in, which is to help ensure that, that those conditions don't change in the, in the favor for them. Great. I'll, I'll turn now to India. We've gotten a couple of questions on uh, the Sino-Indian border standoff, which obviously, unfortunately, looks like it's heating back up in the last few days. Um, the, the report I thought was quite interesting in this regard. Folks that are just in the middle of reading it will have to remember that this is the 2020 report, but it looks at China in uh, 2019. So you're not going to find a big section on um, what's been going on the last few months on the Sino-Indian border. Um, but nonetheless, uh, you know, there's, there's a comment in here which struck me, which is that in practice, the PRC often favors dialogue as a power play and as a means of using political, economic, and military coercion rather than force. Um, and you know, this year, we've really seen that shift pretty substantially on the Sino-Indian border in a way that has surprised a lot of us. 
Uh, and so one of the questions that we got asked, uh, how do you see India's strengths and weaknesses as a potential counterweight to China? And you know, how does Beijing see India? Um, and how is that playing into this border standoff that's been going on for now, I guess, a couple of months? Yeah, the, uh, the, uh, as you lay out there, I think very clearly is, is that the, the line of control or the border issue, the, the disagreements over sovereignty claims by both sides is, is uh, certainly part of a much more holistic picture about uh, relations writ large, and then certainly how those relations comport with broader international activities and other relationships, not least of which is with the United States, I believe. Uh, certainly, it's uh, in the United States' interest is that if these matters are peacefully resolved. I think we've stated that very clearly. Um, it certainly has been demonstrated through indications by leadership on both sides, China and India, for an aspiration and a desire to do so, not least of which for what I watch is the Chinese expressing a desire to, to have peaceful resolution of this of, of the current tensions. Um, long term, the, the Chinese have certainly endeavored to cultivate India, I think, uh, for several reasons. Uh, one is to mitigate their own risk uh, that they have. India is not an insignificant uh, actor in the international uh, environment. Um, it certainly butts right up against China in areas where the Chinese feel that they're uh, both vulnerable and, and highly sensitive. Um, I think that they have not, uh, they have felt that the, the Indians have not reciprocated to them um, as fully, which um, there's good reasons why, I would say. Um, we have certainly talked uh, to the Indians and, and, and I don't want to get into the discussions or, or uh, aspects of, of what we said to them, but certainly writ large is there's very clear uh, aspirations that we have is for improved and increased and expanded relationship with India. They, they're certainly a, a core element of the international environment writ large. It's, it's a partnership that we've always uh, endeavored to expand on and, and will continue to do so. Um, in the in the near term, there's certainly no desire by any part. I think is to extend have this exacerbate or escalate into crisis or conflict. But but we're continuing to closely monitor that and watch that, and and certainly uh, work efforts on all sides to uh, to to bring this back to a negotiated uh, settlement here. And then the the final uh, you know flashpoint that that's often discussed has been South China Sea. Uh, the the report mentions the South China Sea and, and goes through some of the challenges in detail. This is, you know, all the more interesting the last week or two because we've seen a lot of action in the South China Sea. We saw uh, missiles shot into the South China Sea by uh, by the PLA. Uh, there's an interesting South China Morning Post article which stated that Beijing had actually instructed the Chinese military not to fire the first shot against the US military. Uh, whether that applied against China's neighbors, I think was much less clear. Um, and then of course, last week, the State Department and Commerce Department put a series of restrictions on uh, US exports uh, to uh, CCCC, which has been involved with much of the dredging in the South China Sea. So uh, tensions just continuing there as they have been for the last six years or so. I, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, the direction that China mil China's military leaders uh, might be heading there. You know, there's been a lot of discussion about the potential for the announcement of straight baselines around the Spratly Islands, about an air defense identification zone that might cover, cover parts of the South China Sea. Um, and obviously we haven't seen that in the last year, but if you can talk a little bit about the direction that things are headed in the South China Sea and, and some of what Chinese leaders are trying to do there, that would be great. Sure, that, that, uh, that's a great question. You should be attentive uh, to that. We certainly are. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll start with is there didn't used to be this much tumult in the South China Sea. It's, this was really a result of the conditions that the Chinese undertook both through their private endeavors, as you mentioned, uh, the construction company that helped manufacture islands out of, out of nothing, uh, the refusal of China to delimit its claims in accordance with the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea uh, auspices, and which would have been the right thing to do. They have not. They've continued to argue uh, and uh, put forward claims that are just inconsistent with international law. That's certainly one of the aspects that we've talked to the Chinese about at multiple levels within the department and other departments, which is just inability to follow international law rules and norms. 
And further is that they seem to not be able to honor the commitments and, and uh, arrangements they've made with others, not least of which is uh, the negotiations about the code of conduct down there. Our president's operations are, are certainly and in, in activities in the South China Sea have called and, and certainly between with our leadership have called repeatedly upon the Chinese, uh, the PLA, the PRC writ large to, uh, to limit the activities of what they're doing, to not militarize their features, to, to halt the, these really unlawful practices and, and expectations they hold for us and others. Uh, we have, as a result, uh, increased the, our DOD activity, particularly our military uh, operations and activities in the South China Sea, both by ourselves and in, in, in coordination with others in the region. Uh, and globally, and we'll continue to do so uh, because really our commitments to the free and open Indo-Pacific writ large, uh, the free and open international order, and when we say we're committed, we're committed and we're all in. Now, I know that that doesn't make the Chinese happy. They tell me that personally and certainly others in, in the leadership here, uh, but that's where we're at. The expectation is that, is that there's there's rules of the internet and laws of the international system and our expectations are for the Chinese to uphold that. And to the degree that they don't, what they'll face is an increasingly networked region that, that responds to them, high, hopefully in, uh, in collaboration and coordination with them, but if, if need be, uh, to compete with them is exactly what the heart of our strategy is. So we'll see that more. Uh, specific to the exercise last week, the Chinese have an ongoing national level exercise that includes all five theaters. It includes activities in the South China Sea, East China Sea, Yellow Sea, and Bohai Gulf. Those missile shots were actually done as a component of a very high level national level exercise. Um, um, but certainly the one critical aspect of that was the degree to which that, that sends not only a broader message of where China wants to go with its military, but it, it's inescapable about the closure areas and, and the missile shots and the other high-end activity that they placed in that region didn't need to be there. They've done that on purpose. And, and certainly an element of that is it's an unhelpful and really intrusive element of, of coercion um, for, mu for multiple actors, not least of which is uh, other claimants in the South China Sea and Southeast Asia. Uh, we don't understand why the Chinese would choose to do that. It's, it's, it, it, it seems um, uh, to be really just not constructive to where they, their stated claims for their aspirations are to re reach peaceful negotiations um, but here we are again with the Chinese continuing to, to take those actions even after they were cautioned to not do so and have pledged to avoid doing so. Yeah. Um, I'm going to turn now to a series of audience questions uh, on a couple of different issues. So uh, I know you'll, you'll have to be flexible with us as we jump around. Uh, so the first is from Eric Schmidt at the New York Times. He notes the possibility of F-35 sales to the UAE and asks, how concerned are you and the Defense Department that such sales could risk the transfer of sensitive technology to China, um, which has obviously deepened ties with the UAE in recent years? What steps could be taken to mitigate that risk? Um, and, and maybe if you can talk a little bit more about the PLA's technology transfer efforts, it's a big part of the report, um, gets, a, gets a large section appropriately. So, uh, so over to you on that issue. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I'll, I'll tell you, that's one that, uh, of course, a new missile or a new aircraft carrier or something is always uh, draws a lot of people's attention. But a lot of the activities of the department in particular and all of the interagency writ large have, have been, in, in some cases uh, of the greatest function, have been in areas like this, where we've made more concentrated efforts to both identify and understand how the Chinese act, um, uh, the interactions, particularly through the military civil fusion development strategy and what those implications are, and we've identified those. You noted in the previous question about uh, uh, state and I think in commerce and some of the actions that have taken, we're working in concert with them uh, literally on a daily basis uh, as our 1237 reporting out of the Defense Department has, has demonstrated about helping identify companies and entities and, and what those risks and working very hard uh, to mitigate those risks. There's more attention on those now than ever. Uh, we're actually taking action on those. And, and I think it's important and very powerful statement, certainly for China and others, and it's having a very clear effect. Uh, that also falls under really a, a broader set of issues. And, and to Eric's question is, um, 
the Department of Defense certainly has robust controls and procedures in place to protect U.S. weapon systems and their technology. We watch those. Some of those are very traditional uh, processes, which are well known. Um, but we've uh, incorporated some new ones as well. Obviously, China is, is a uniquely aggressive and capable adversary when it comes to protecting our military technology edge. Our allies and partners, including the UAE, are required to meet extremely high standards uh, of security in order to acquire and deploy these systems. And we've instituted uh, both more pragmatic help to our allies and partners to understand that, improving our processes through CFIUS and other kinds of security cooperation practices, and have begun undertaking uh, more efforts to work with allies and partners on sharing best practices for export and import controls, oversight of technology transfers, and making sure that we have all the best practices in place. So you'll continue to see that built up. It's obviously having an effect on the on China as we speak. And we, we, we anticipate that we'll continue to have a, a broader effect as, as time goes on. Great. I, I want to turn to a couple of very specific points on nuclear and missile forces from some of the questioners. Uh, so it may just be that you can't answer these or can't do so in this forum, and uh, in, in which case, just let us know and we'll move on. The, the first is okay. from Takeshi Kurahara at uh, NHK in Japan, who asks um, that this report, as I stated, has uh, something above 200, the low 200s for the number of nuclear warheads uh, uh, that it says are operational. And he wants to clarify whether by operational, this means ready to launch right away or, or whether these are capable of being assembled um, and then deployed at, you know, at, at some time horizon. So um, how, does, how should we read the word operational in, in the report this year? Uh, you know, I don't recall. I think we we refer to it as a component of their stockpile. Certainly, there's some that are operational to some extent. I'm not sh exactly sure the the precise definition of that, so I, I will stay away from that. In, in terms of specificity, of that question, I, I'm certain I can't go into much greater detail to that. What I can say is that uh, that's an aspect of of what we pursue for greater transparency from the from the PLA in particular and China writ large, which is it is time for us to talk about these issues, particularly with what we've reported on and understand as their aspirations. And, and we'll seek that they do so. There's there's other facets beyond just the numbers themselves or even the operationalization. Uh, there's there's critical aspects of what you would refer to as commingling or entanglement of nuclear and non-nuclear systems. It's, it's really vital that we, that we begin to address uh, with the Chinese um, and, I, and we certainly have plans in the near term to raise that with them. Great. Another question along uh, similar lines is uh, from Tony Capaccio at Bloomberg. And he, he wants to know a little bit more about the Gen class uh, nuclear deterrence patrols. It, these are mentioned in the report, obviously. The, the report says that uh, in order to hit the continental United States, they'd have to be somewhat close to Hawaii. Uh, and, and so Tony's question is, uh, can you say anything publicly about whether the PLA Navy has actually started any of those nuclear deterrence patrols and, and whether they do in fact sail uh, close enough to Hawaii that they could be operational? Yeah, I, I, I really can't speak to that issue in, in this fora here. Um, the report, I think, is going to have to stand for itself about what, what's in there right now. I, I can't elaborate past that. Certainly the gen is a submarine that uh, does go to sea from time to time and what their capacities are and how they're loaded out and, and what the readiness is. It's, it's just not something I can dive into too deeply. Yeah, completely understand that. Um, and, and then one more on, on missiles. Uh, I think this is really more about, uh, you know, what the Defense Department uh, puts out in, in the public view. This is from Masashi Murano over at the Hudson Institute. Uh, he notes that uh, there used to be an upper limit on the number of missiles in the China military power report. And uh, this year that's obviously transitioned uh, for those of you that have had a chance to look at it. So rather than providing a range, it uh, gives a lower uh, bound, but not an upper bound. Um, and so uh, Masashi Murano is wondering if you can say anything about sort of what the, the logic of this change was um, and then uh, is it possible that DOD assesses that the Chinese are actually retiring a certain number of aging missiles um, so that they can have a more uh, ready force of, of more modernized missiles? Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, numbers, obviously there's a lot of numbers across the entirety of the report. Uh, accounting practices for how we count things, you know, that can be, it, it's often a subjective rather than an objective process. 
Uh, we did change the practice for how we did that this year. There's, there was multiple reasons for that. Uh, one of the instincts here was to provide the greatest clarity and accuracy to the report that we possibly could. Um, in terms of retiring, uh, retiring uh, systems, I'll tell you off, off the top of my head, I, I don't recall that. That might be something I'll have to, to re-engage on in, in, in specific uh, aspects. I don't believe that that's the case. Um, although there have been some very older models that they believe that they are starting to do, but I, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm getting into territory that I'm not, I don't have great certainty on. So I'll have to, I'll have to reset that for a different time and place to, to do so. Roger that. Um, and then uh, over to a couple of questions that uh, a number of folks have asked about uh, China's maritime buildup. So one thing that really sticks out in the report is that early on the document notes that China now has the largest Navy in the world. Uh, last year's document said China had the largest Navy in the region. And uh, you know, I don't think it's necessarily that the numbers have changed a, a huge amount on the Chinese side if you actually go uh, towards the back and, and look at the naval numbers. Um, but the report notes that uh, China now fields, the PLA Navy fields 350 ships compared to the US Navy's 293. Um, and yet at the same time, you know, there's a lot of discussion in public about uh, whether Chinese leaders might be restrained by the fact that they haven't fought a major war in decades and don't have a lot of experience doing so. And I'm wondering if you can say anything about whether that fact plays a restraining role, at least in your view, on the Chinese leadership's willingness to use force. Yeah, uh, two great questions, both uh, linked, I think. Um, I'll start with your latter one first. Well, I'll, I'll begin with the numbers one, which is uh, we do report, I think, accurately about what the Chinese numbers are and, and what their growth uh, looks like out, out into the future, which is an increase. Certainly, I'll note that this year, the Chinese again increased their defense budget, uh, telling us that they still have aspirations for those to grow, and, and uh, not least of which is the PLA's capacity, uh, particularly the PLA Navy and uh, their one of their subordinate elements, the PLA Marine Corps, uh, requirements to have greater far seas or global power projection capacity. So those, those numbers will likely increase and, and we estimate that they will. Of course, numbers are one element. Um, that's not all of the elements. There's tonnage, capacity, capability sets, sophistication, uh, and a whole range of other kind of uh, logistics, communication aspects to that. So of course the caution is always numbers are one element, not the entirety of the element. Uh, I can't speak to uh, U.S. forces. The, those are things that will come out in discussions between the departments and certainly the secretary. Um, but, but this report obviously is intended to help inform that discussion. And so uh, the, the deepest and best and clearest understanding that we have should be uh, uh, for that. It's one of the reasons we, we provide this to Congress so that we could help have those discussions across all elements of the United States government. Um, in terms of as they go forward and, and out in the future and particularly uh, on a more global scale, that that remains a critical element. This is highly consistent with China's military strategy and its concepts and teaching about its own military strategy. They have a very unique, in fact, very specific definition of, of active defense itself of what the purpose of their military strategy is. They refer to that as uh, these, as you note, these these constraints on uh, the is really in Chinese logic, which is a dialectic is a requirement on one hand to safeguard its national interests and on the other hand, not do so in a manner that would be catastrophic towards long-term aspirations. I don't, I don't think that's an unusual constraint on any the use of force by any leader anywhere. But for the Chinese themselves, they call it the dialectical unity of war restraint and war winning and always having to make sure that they're calculating uh, about how you balance between those two things. As I've talked to the Chinese, their current military strategy includes that. Their 2019 defense white paper uh, express that as I've talked to them. Um, and when I talked to them about their, their near-term military strategy reforms or reformations, uh, they've, they've, they've um, communicated that they find that will remain a consistent aspect of how they define their own military strategies and their use of force, which is, is to be bound by those two conditions. So I think that's informative when you understand about how the Chinese make and think about the use of force, which is always in that context of the degree to which it might result in a permanent loss of an, an, a, a strategic national uh, interest or objective set, political objective, uh, but also the degree to which it, it might ultimately distract or have a catastrophic effect on China's long-term national aspirations, which are right now prioritized on developmental issues. Great. 
Um, and then an, another question uh, talking about an issue we haven't discussed yet, which is space. Uh, from Jack Bayer at the Washington Free Beacon. He asked, uh, could you talk a little bit more about China's space capabilities and their long-term trajectory in terms of their um, strategic and, and economic interests in space? Yeah, again, it's uh, um, this is going to begin to sound like a little bit of a repeating record, and uh, but but I think that's important. Uh, which is, you know, when you listen to the Chinese communist leadership, particularly Xi Jinping, uh, who serves as the Chinese say as the core of the party, uh, he's 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 outlined very specific requirements and expectations he has in, in multiple areas and domains. Uh, we I raised about the Chinese aspiration for achieving maritime great power status. Uh, he's done the same in terms of having a, a space great power status. And that's uh, being a space great power by every measurable uh, yardstick that you can throw up there, not least of which is capacity for the military. This includes enhanced communication, tracking, surveillance, ISR, research, exploration, uh, every facet um, that's interlinked not only with the space-based capabilities that you, that you think about every day, uh, in terms of uh, how you would apply those, but also as a critical element of, of attaining uh, what they call a technological great power status, which is to being in the most advanced fields and seizing the technological high ground or, or seizing the advanced ca uh, high ground and advanced capabilities, which they think that, that will give them a national advantage. Space is certainly central to that. There's other fields. I don't think space is uh, any lower on the priority than any uh, anything else. It's a, it's a top priority for them. They see that as a critical advantage. And it's always a good reminder, I think certainly when we talk about it within the department itself is, is that you know, those are choices uh, that countries have to make. Those are technological choices. They certainly bring advantages. There's, there's, they also bring disadvantages. Those are huge costs. That's huge intellectual investment, uh, bureaucratic organization, uh, transformation of organizations, intent. Uh, it's, it's capital investments, time investments, prestige investments they've made. And they've chosen to make those investments and they've chosen for a reason, uh, which is that their aspirations are not small. They're not moderated. They're not, uh, I don't think the Chinese are settling on becoming just one of, uh, they do have a very clear and definitive aspiration for becoming uh, a global power preeminent by all measures, uh, or at least in terms of status to any others. And uh, space is not the, not the least of that. So I know that's probably not great depth. I, I can tell you is I don't have off the top of my head a Rolodex of all the different satellite capacities that the Chinese are, are producing or space-based capabilities. But it's, it's self-evident in watching what they're doing in terms of uh, their, their exploration capacities as they've sent things to the moon and then the other uh, commercial and military uh, um, uh, aspects of uh, space activities. It's, it's not insignificant and it's, it's um, um, not going to go away anytime soon. So. Wonderful. Okay, I, we've just about reached our end point, but I want to ask you one final question sure. because it's gotten so much attention recently. Uh, this is from Adam Zhu over at the Voice of America, and he asks, how would you assess uh, the PLA's infiltration of universities um, outside of China, of course, um, and how is DOD working with U.S. research institutes and, and others uh, to handle this issue. There's, there's been a lot of press about this recently, and I know, you know the Department of Justice appears to be doing a lot of work on this issue. Is there anything that you can tell us about, about this before we close? Yeah, I will. I, I, you know, I mentioned some of the economic uh, actions that the, the entirety of the United States government, particularly the interagency has taken, and, and this is another one of those fields. So in concert through the interagency, really coordinated obviously by the national security staff, is identifying and understanding where threats and risks are, where the challenges of what we face. And really for a long time, it's not necessarily that we didn't know these things were going on. We just weren't necessarily taking specific action. So that's what's happened. Uh, the national security strategy, uh, the, the guidance and direction from the White House and, the, and certainly the national security staff is, we've gotten on these tasks and it's a very robust and very comprehensive element. So again, it's not necessarily a new ship or a new tank, but certainly in terms of policy practices, one of those things we've undertaken and within the department itself, uh, mostly through acquisition and sus uh, sustainability and the research and engineering elements have identified where there might be either critical risks to uh, uh, 
supply chain issues within the department or even within the research organization, those take balances and choices that we have to make. We're doing those in conjunction uh, with other elements, the Department of Justice, state, and others in terms of how we react to that. And we're trying to make sure that we find a good balance between ensuring that the activities of anybody at any of these uh, research organizations or through the universities is, is properly accounted for, understood, uh, and, and, and watched and monitored very carefully. And uh, that they don't have a critical aspect that might provide um, uh, undesirable insights to what the De Department of Defense is doing. But I'll, I'll tell you, we're all over it. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time. I want to uh, provide three three big thank yous uh, for this event. The first is uh, for the audience for joining us and for asking so many excellent questions. And I will apologize that there were many more that we were not able to get to. Uh, the second is to our team at AEI uh, and yours at the Pentagon for putting this all together. I know it's a huge amount of work. Easier for us to do the, the video than it is for your team to actually write the 200-page report. Uh, but uh, we're really happy to be able to join you for this rollout. And lastly, uh, thank you, Chad, for joining us today and for talking so thoroughly about all of these issues. We really appreciate it. And I hope you stay safe and healthy and best wishes to everyone on the call going ahead. Uh, Zach, thank you. I'll, I'll certainly echo my appreciate, appreciation to you, all the staff you have there, AEI, all the participants at Cellful. It, it would be wrong if I, if I didn't um, uh, highlight uh, the role of the Defense Intelligence Enterprise and the others around the department here and, and producing the report. You, you see my face, but it's really their work. And I encourage you to read it, uh, others to read it, uh, examine it, and, and uh, certainly we'll, we'll try to make ourselves available as we can to help discuss it further. So. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us and everyone stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Tim.